Hello, everyone. Um, I am Tom Haviv. Thank you so much for coming to this Zoom event. Um, I am the creative director and co-founder of Ion Press. Uh, briefly, Ion Press is an independent publisher rooted in Jewish culture and emanating out. In other words, we're doing Jewish publishing for all people. I am very excited and honored to introduce Dr. Gabor Mate and Rabbi Dr. Tears of Firestone for our conversation today on intergenerational Jewish trauma. Gabor is an internationally renowned speaker, highly sought after for his expertise on addiction, trauma, childhood development, and the relationship of stress and illness. His fifth book, The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture, was released last September and is an international bestseller. Rabbi Dr. Tears of Firestone is an author, Jungian psychotherapist, leader in the international Jewish renewal movement and renowned Jewish scholar and teacher. Her latest work, Wounds into Wisdom, Healing Intergenerational Jewish Trauma, is the recipient of the 2020 Nautilus Book Award in Psychology and the Wim Jewish Women's Caucus of the Association of Women in Psychology 2020 Book Award and was just released in a new paperback edition. I'm also very happy to introduce my friend and rabbi, Amichai Lau Levi, visionary leader and founder of LabShul, who will open and close our conversation today. Um, and I want to thank our co sponsors, Monkfish Publishing, LabShul, and Sand. Uh, I think there will be links in the chat for all these organizations. And please also look for links to Tirza and Gabor's most recent books. Um, Thank you again for coming, and I'm now handing it over to Amichai. Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, friends. Nice to see familiar faces on the screen and in the chat. It is a great honor to be here today and help facilitate this important conversation. I see the chat's already bubbling with excitement and questions. This is obviously a super important topic close to all of our hearts. So I'll just introduce with a couple of words before I hand it over to um, the two speakers today uh, when I spoke with my friend and teacher and Rabbi Tirza just a few weeks ago. Tirza, you mentioned that Dr. Gabor is your rabbi. So really between the three of us, there is a rabbinic tri tri tribunal here this afternoon. Gabor, I don't know if you've already had that title. But we, as a tribunal of three rabbis, with all of us on call, can help annul and heal and at least address some of the many, many traumas and memories, stories, and hopes that we bring to this afternoon today. Um, I want to say to all of us who are joining us, this uh, Zoom is being recorded, so you can watch it later. I also want to invite you to just take care of yourself. This is a conversation that might bring up some questions and might bring up some difficulties we're dealing with with important and tough issues. So take care of yourself. Breathe as you need to, pause as you need to, take notes as you need to. We're here to grow and to heal by looking at two our big questions together. I mean, hi, let me just, be... I'm sorry, let me just jump in for a minute. The host needs to allow me to start my video. Now, if you guys don't want to look at my face, I totally understand, but <laughs> just let me know, okay? And... <laughs> I'm sure that's going to happen. Right. Okay, all right. Here. Hi, yeah. Gabor. Nice Hi. to see you. <laughs> Nice to see so, you as we, so as we start this conversation, I just want to frame it in the context uh, of Tirza's amazing book with Dr. Garber's introduction and, of course, your extensive work on this notion of trauma with a very short story that frames us in this conversation with our friends from Ayn and the, the context of dealing with intergenerational trauma and healing from a Jewish perspective. A very short story that shows up in the rabbinic literature in the Midrash. And this is a story about a group of rabbis who are looking at uh, Jerusalem uh, shortly after the destruction of Jerusalem during the Second Temple some 2,000 years ago. And of course, looking at Jerusalem right now today and asking questions uh, is part of what we're doing here today. But in that story, this group of rabbis is looking at a destroyed Jerusalem, at a destroyed temple that the Romans have completely burnt. And they're seeing a fox, a wild fox, walking out of what was once the Holy of Holies of the Temple of Jerusalem, where nobody can 
could have been able to enter before the destructions. And the rabbis begin to weep. They're seeing the most sacred, intimate place as a wild place of foxes. But one of the rabbis begins to laugh. His name is Rabbi Akiva, and he laughs and laughs. And the rab rabbis who are weeping are saying, what's the matter with you? You're looking at the worst destruction in our memory. Why are you laughing? And Rabbi Akiva says, you know why I'm laughing? Because there were prophecies in our history. There was a prophet who said this will happen, that destruction will happen and the house of God, the temple will go up in flames. But there was another prophet who said, there will be redemption. Old people will sit calmly in the streets of Jerusalem and kids will play. That prophecy became true. This prophecy will come true. We're crying now. I'm laughing for the future. And so this conversation tonight, today, is about how we look at our traumas, how we find ways to laugh, and how we honor the place of tears. How do we not just look at where we are now, but where we come from and where we are going? So without further ado, I'm going to turn it to Tirza and to Gabor. And we wanted to maybe have time for three questions today and start off by asking you, what is your personal story? What's at stake for you both to, as you introduce yourselves, to talk to us about why you've chosen this work about trauma and healing. And I'm gonna mute myself and turn it over to you, Tirza, and then over to you, Gabor. Okay, thank you so much, Amichai. Uh, and for that beautiful, powerful teaching that brings in the wildness of life and the wildness of creatures, and I hope we do talk about hopefulness and what's hopeful here on the, on the, uh, on the world stage and in our hearts. Um, I want to thank everyone who's tuned in today, this evening, this morning, wherever you are on the planet. I so appreciate it. I, and including a thanks to uh, all of our ancestors, <laughs> all of our wise and well ancestors from all the lineages that are represented here today. May they be here listening in and getting what we call nachas, we getting pride and, and, and fulfillment in our conversation as we remember them. Um, thanks to our sponsors, to Ayin, all the producers. Thank you so, so much. And the team that is producing this hour, especially to Ray Abalea and Abby Nokan and Panina and Tom and Carly, all of you, thank you. And especially to you, Gabor, thank you so much for, for joining us and me today and for that beautiful foreword that you wrote for my book, Wounds into Wisdom. And I'm so curious to see what is going to emerge today because this is unscripted, as I've said, and that's the way we like it. Um, I, um, I guess I want to start by saying that you may not know this, Gabor, but uh, you were born almost to the day of my eldest brother, just at the end, really not still in the war, World War II, but at the, toward the end, uh, my eldest brother, Danny, January of, I believe it was 1944. And he died young. He died at 30, but like you, he was an incredible iconoclast. He turned over every stone. He asked every question. He particularly railed against the myth of normal, <laughs> in particular in Judaism. Um, the, the conventions in Judaism that had lost their humanity. And uh, so I just want to bring him into this conversation and say how much uh, I appreciate your life force and how much I appreciate your goodness. Um, yeah, you're showing how you show up for the world. Um, we were raised, my six siblings, uh, were raised in a post-Holocaust home. My mother was a German refugee who narrowly escaped, narrowly escaped Nazi Europe in 1939. All of her cousins, uncles and aunts were murdered, but one cousin who escaped uh, and uh, never talked about it, but certainly it was in the house, <laughs> let's just say. And my father was a, an American Jewish kid from Brooklyn who was who uh, was in the US Army, uh, deployed to a deadly bomb disposal squad squadron and found himself in Bergen-Belsen uh, upon the liberation and saw the unseeable and also never 
talked about it. But after his death, we opened his cleaning out his desk drawers, found the photographs that he had taken of the most unseeable things. So the emergence of their secrets helped me to connect the dots and put me where I am today, uh, connecting the dots, asking the big questions, how these things, these uh, trauma residues, these unmetabolized, unmetabolized trauma residues come out into the atmosphere of our world. They're toxic, they are pathogenic and how they must be faced. And when they aren't faced, how they how they get transmitted from generation to generation. In Judaism, we say made door la door. You know, it's a very big thing, uh, the ethos of generation to generation. But we we also need to remember that there are wisdom legacies. There are also trauma legacies that get translated from from and transmitted generation generation to generation. So. Um, I will say put one more thing on the table to say what has propelled me to be here. And that is that after I became a rabbi, I um, conscripted myself with the human rights, uh, human rights organizations, and one in particular, Rabbis for Human Rights in Israel, Palestine. And uh, this is already mm, maybe 15, 20 years into my rabbinate, but I went many times to Israel and Palestine and went behind the separation barrier there and into the refugee camps and onto the streets, uh, to the checkpoints and experienced there and uh, <laughs> saw, in a sense, saw the unseeable, saw what I was just, I didn't have the kalium, I didn't have the the uh, wherewithal to, uh, I was shocked basically. And uh, once again, I started to connect the dots and I realized that, and this has very much to do with our conversation. It's why I'm bringing it in and Wounds into Wisdom is, is all about this because it's uh, stories and research from Jews around the world who've gone through the, the worst tragedies and traumas uh, that there could not be political or human rights solutions without some nervous system reboot, so to speak, without really doing our work at a different level. Otherwise, the policies in Israel and the the things that are happening on the on the you know the ground level uh, couldn't change. I worked there for ten years, going twice a year, working and planting trees and harvesting all, nothing was changing. In fact, it was going backwards. And I realized that this is the residue of profound trauma that we hadn't faced our profound grief. Uh, there are trauma survivors all over the world in Israel and, uh, and there is deep healing to be done. And without that, we were destined to reenact our traumas again and again. And that's one of the the hallmarks of trauma. So I, I think I've said enough right now. All of this propelled me to write Wounds into Wisdom and all of this got me here today. And I'm so happy to be here with my my big brother, Gabor. Thank you. Thank you, Tirza. Um I think one of the great strengths of your book is that um, you look upon everybody um, particularly, but not exclusively, your fellow Jews with such compassion. And um, the question you're asking is, what can be learned from our wounds? What can be learned from our own history? And uh, what can we learn, not so just to benefit others, but also that what can we do, what can we learn from our own experience so that we can get liberated from our past? And I think all trauma work essentially comes down to liberating ourselves from our past. So that what happened in the past doesn't control who I am and what I do and believe in the present. Um, we can answer questions about the very painful Israel-Palestine issue that you brought up. <clears throat> I can only tell you that when I visited there the first time, I cried every day for two weeks. This is in the occupied territories. 
I just wept every day to, to see what I was seeing. Now, I mean, our question was what impelled us on this work. Um, let me just tell you a story uh, that I only learned recently, actually, because I've found the diary of a cousin of mine who's no longer alive, who was 12 years older than I, uh, who left Hungary when I was a very small child with her family. They went to Israel. There as an adolescent, she developed polio during that terrible polio epidemic of the early 1950s before the days of polio vaccination. And then because they were hoping for better treatment, they moved to uh, from Israel to Munich, Germany, and that's where she lived. But she wrote her memoirs um, before her own death. And she wrote about me. And... Uh, in December of 1944, under the conditions of war and viciously murderous anti-Semitism in Budapest, this is after the deportations to the camps had stopped already, but the virulently anti-Semitic, pornographically anti-Semitic and violent crossed arrows party was in power in Hungary, and they were murdering Jews every day. And there was a safe house, a relative safe house, relative, under the nominal protection of the Swiss embassy. And um, thanks to a Swiss uh, diplomat called Karl Lutz. And this is called the glass house. And it's still there in Budapest. There's still a little museum there. I stood there just a few months ago. And my mother got admission to that house out of thousands of Jews lining up outside because she was the daughter of Dr. Joseph Levy, who had been killed in Auschwitz in June of that year, but who had been a very prominent Zionist leader in southern Slovakia, where they lived. And when the groups that conducted this safe house le learned that Joseph Levy's grandson was outside. They let us in. Well, I stayed there for two days because the conditions were horrible. I mean, you can imagine a thousand or more people crowded into a, a house big enough to hold a hundred. So the hygienic conditions, the food, the noise, it was just, and I was ill and my mother thought I wouldn't live if I had to stay there. So she went into the street and I stood on the paving stone when this happened, handed me to a total stranger, asking her to conduct me uh, to some relatives in hiding, in relative safety. And that's where I was looked after for five or six weeks by my cousin, Marta. And being that I was very sick uh, as a one-year-old, my cousin's father, my uncle, actually risked his life to find a Christian doctor to come and look at me because they thought I might have tuberculosis. I didn't have tuberculosis. The doctor examined me. I don't have to tell you the conditions even in that home, 25 people crowded into an apartment where only one room could be heated. And because I was crying so much, because I was so sick, the other tenants wouldn't have me in the room. So my cousin and her brother took me to one of the cold rooms and between their bodies, they kept me warm at night. So this doctor comes and examines me. And as, as she leaves, I'm, I'm lying there on the table kind of crying and the doctor pats my head and said, don't worry, my little son, you will pay them back. And when she said, you will pay them back, she didn't mean that you'll exact revenge. She meant that you will pay back to the world the kindness that you received from your cousin, from your uncle, and and from your mother who gave me to a total stranger to save your life. And uh, so if you ask me, I didn't know that story. I only learned that story four years ago when I read my cousin's memoirs. But I mean, I, when you ask me what draws me to this work, there's the answer. There's the answer. And uh, 
I'll just close by saying that, Teresa, when you talked about how working through our own traumas will help us show up differently in the world, and when you talked about that somehow we've lost sight, some of us, of the some aspects, some of the most beautiful aspects of the Jewish tradition. I think it's in Exodus. I think it's Exodus 23.9, if I remember right. <clears throat> remember what that says, Teresa? <laughs> Not exactly that verse, but I have a feeling where you're going. They say, thou shalt not oppress a stranger, mm -hmm. for you know the heart of a stranger, you who yourselves were strangers in Egypt. That's right. If we don't remember and understand and work through our own trauma, this is true in personal life, and it's true in political life, we will just transmit it to other people, whether we mean to or not. And doesn't matter what story we tell ourselves. And I think one of the one of the strengths of your book, another great strength of your book, there. So if you want to just comment on that, is you really um, challenge, in a very compassionate and very empowering way, uh, two Jewish concepts. Uh, one is sort of our sense of automatic victimhood, <laughs> and the other is our chosenness. Do you want to talk about those? Yeah, yeah. I think. Uh interviewing many, many people who survived uh, racial traumas, religious traumas, because we were, uh, you know, th and these are the same for people around the world. It's not that we, uh, they are strictly Jewish traumas, but the traumas of discrimination uh, and listening to their stories and listening to what, these are the people who did the hard work and came through becoming moral leaders, becoming teachers, becoming breaking out of, I'm thinking of one uh, Rami El-Khanan, uh, Amichai, you probably know him, he's become very famous in, in Israel, but he was, he had become his, his, his daughter, his beloved daughter had uh, been blown up in a suicide bombing at, at the year, the age of 14, and he became like a wild animal, he became, in the worst sense, uh, just angry and vicious and cynical and something happened that just flipped his, you know, he became uh, a victim par excellence in a, in a sense of vengeance and uh, wanted blood. And then he went through an experience of seeing some of the Israeli war heroes stepping off the bus with Palestinian farmers, uh, peasants who were all together in this, this particular uh, NGO, uh, the Bereaved Family Forum. And uh, they were all bereaved parents, all of them, and something flipped for him. And he, um, he just broke out of this. It was like something crashed for him. And in uh, Kabbalistic terms, we would say he had a shvirat ha'kelim, something burst. Uh, his his paradigm burst, and he realized the humanity, the suffering, the human suffering that is so universal. And uh, and he he broke down, and he realized that he hadn't faced his grief; it had all turned into viciousness and into anger. And he started to really do his work at a different level. These are the kinds of people that um, that are in this book, and they talk about the vic the, the trap of victimhood. And also the trap of specialness, this, this idea in Judaism that we're a, 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 a chosen people, a light unto the nations, you know, and, and, and many of them said, well, what are we chosen for? This is, this is rubbish unless we really understand that our suffering is not particular to us, that our suffering is only a lens through which to see the world and to, to break our hearts open for the suffering of other people and to help them. And to understand that there is no other, uh, that the other, you know, that is why I think in in the Elder Testament and the Torah, there is this repetition 38, 36 times, I believe, of that particular verse you quoted, uh, some variation thereof. It's a, a redundancy because I think the Hebrew tradition understands the nature. Our nature is to just go into vengeance, to go into othering. Uh, what they say, alterity is a word that's been coined now, uh, you know, to I it, 
in Buber's language, to make the other an it rather than see that they are us, that we are them, and that our suffering can inform inform our lives. So yeah, victim breaking out of our victimhood, breaking out of our chosenness, our specialness, those aren't Jewish principles, certainly, but they're for everyone who's who has suffered, um, who has suffered trauma. So let me ask you this. Um, let's just actually I'd like to pause for a moment to acknowledge just the suffering that's in the world right now. I mean, saliently in countries like Turkey and, and Syria, where it's just unspeakable right now. Yes. You know, babies being dug out of the rubble, you know, and human beings. And, uh, uh, but in terms of trauma, um, and they're suffering in Gaza, they're suffering in the occupied territories, they're suffering in Jerusalem. People are mourning relatives who were killed recently by walking the streets. Yeah. And if we don't single out individuals to blame for this, we just have to really ask what's going on here on a large scale and how can we stop this madness? But let's acknowledge the suffering in the world. Jewish trauma, right? You just talked about this. Is there such a thing as Jewish trauma? There's such a thing as Jewish history. There's such a thing as events that happened <clears throat> to Jews. Uh, and I don't care what anybody says. There's been mass murder forever. But there's been nothing like the genocide in Eastern Europe. Yeah. In a mechanized, bureaucratic, technological, very deliberate way. It didn't happen in the heat of war or conquest it even happened in a way that took away from the nazi war effort because when at a time when their armies were under severe pressure they devoted trains to transporting jews to their deaths but there's nothing like that in history that i know of so in the sense of the horror the the events it is unique because as best i can tell from my understanding of history it's almost unique. It's unique, certainly in its scale. At the same time, a lot of other people have been murdered and massacred and killed and um, persecuted. Is there such thing as Jewish trauma? Now, I'm not asking, is there such thing as Jewish history? There is. Is there such thing as Jewish trauma? Because that's what your book is about. So what is your understanding of that? <laughs> yeah. I think there is uh, for every ethnicity there is their own uh, there is their own brand of trauma. The Ukrainians will have for generations <clears throat> their their traumas at the family separations and displacements and the horror of bombs going off and um, just the needless the needless loss of life uh, that they're going through that will be with them for generations and they will need to they will need help uh processing and digesting all of that and 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 for jews yes we've had our brand uh, the the brand of jewish trauma however gets to be um you know there is a almost a trademark of jewish trauma which i find pretty awful uh nobody has had a genocide like us and nobody uh you know, I think that, that that specialness is is not warranted and is not necessary and is odious. Um, but there has been there has been scapegoating and there has been discrimination for literally thousands of years of our people, displacement all throughout the world. Uh, so that by the time we as a as a people got uh, a piece, a tract of land, <laughs> then we saw what happened there. I think that all of that, that trajectory is so, is just a lens through which to see human nature. That's how I look at it. And what happens when the victim becomes uh, powerful again and, and, uh, and starts to see the world through the eyes of, uh, of superiority. And then there is uh, Jewish superiority 
all of a sudden there is a, another kind of racism that flips on its head. In Jungian psychology, we use a word called, uh, that's from Greek, enantiodromia, which means the flipping. I think it's from, I think it's from uh, Plato or way back. It's, it's how history turns on its head and, and does a little cartwheel and the, victim, uh, the victims become the victimizers and everything turns like that. If you wait long enough, that happens and that's human nature. So for me, Jewish trauma is a lens through which to, to look at human nature, that's all. Okay. I don't wanna to get too precious about it or too special about it, you know. Um, on the other hand, I do want to say um, that, uh, that the ancestors, those who, one of my first, I'll tell it, uh, one of the first um, realizations I had came from a dream that I had in my 20s in which, and I tell this in Wounds into Wisdom, in which uh, my Hungarian, all of a sudden I walk into this room, I didn't even know my background, I didn't know my ancestry or that, that I had relatives from Hungary and Austria and Hungary, but here were these uh, these skeleton women having a tea party all dressed up. They were, but they were clearly dead and they were speaking mm. in these outrageous uh, Hungarian kind of accents. And they all looked at me and I was the depressed 20 year old. Excuse, excuse me, Hungarian accent is not outrageous. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> it's very high class. It's very, it's very, drinking, it's a very high class accent. Thank drinking you. tea with their fingers up and they were... <laughs> They were uh, they were really like all in their furs and um, and they all looked up at me and said, "Oh my God, look at you and your depression. What's what's all this about? Your heaviness? Can't you see? Can't you see you're alive? Live the life we could not live. Why aren't you living the life that we could not live? Go enjoy yourself. Go be happy. Go get nice things. We love nice things. Go live the life we could not live." their lives had been cut short and they wanted me to, mm -hmm. to enjoy myself. And here I was heavy with survivor's guilt. Uh, so there is this, there is this, uh, I think, admonition to really live and do and create and go to the limits of what we can do in this, in this life. We are, we are in a sense, the, answers to their prayers. I sometimes allow myself for a split moment to follow them into their last moments in the gas chambers or in the in the barracks and 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 feel just for a minute I can let myself feel what it might be like to what what was the last prayer that they had and I think I imagine anyway this is my fantasy that they Pray that there would be offspring, that there would be flowers that would still blossom out of their lives. And, and we are those flowers. Uh, many of us living, many of us hearing this conversation are uh, progeny of, of people who died abruptly and violently. And uh, can we live to the limits and, and make them proud? So that's one of my prayers is to, um, to, bring, them, to, to bring them joy. What you said about joy, it, it, not that I know much about it, but it reminds me of what little I know of the Hasidic tradition. It was not all about celebrating life originally, at least. Absolutely. Yeah. Serve with joy. Yeah. To serve with joy. Yeah. So, um, Amichai, I think you wanted to ask us about something uh, yeah, and this is a wonderful moment to uh, really such a powerful conversation from the both of you. Um, had we had more time, I would have invited my uh, alter ego, who is a Hungarian Holocaust survivor, grand lady in furs and a very high class Hungarian accent, yeah. who has helped me deal with my Holocaust family story through humor. And uh, trying to bring joy into trauma in so many ways, as, as you're both doing. And I, I wanted to ask you, there, there are quite a few questions coming in the, in the chat that I'll share with you in a moment. But as, as we're focusing on this work and on the, not just the Jewish, but the human aspect of, of the inherited multi-generational trauma, we want to ask you about hope. Like, how does hope come into this? 
And, um, and I want to say, uh, Tirza, there's a quote from your book, which I indeed cherish, that says, uh, trauma changes us in permanent ways, but we have a choice about the outcome of our story. We can bemoan our fate as victims, or we can recognize our pain and follow the circumstances of our lives into unforeseen directions and new meanings. We can ask. What does this terrible wound inspire me to do that I would never have thought to do otherwise? And as individuals, and perhaps in the Jewish conversation, there's the, there's the notion of perhaps being the chosen people with all of its baggage. And you're talking about what does it mean to be the choosing people, to mm. choose out of the trauma and out of the pain and out of the history, a path out, a path that sees the other not as other that transcends pain into hope and into, into repair, which we need so much right now. So I'm gonna read some of these questions in a little bit, but perhaps you can both just take a few moments to share from your difficult work with individuals, with, with, with society, where does hope lie for us right now? What is hopeful in this work that right now resonates for you? Gabor, please. Well, um, I don't deal very much in hope, um, which is the wish that something good will happen in the future. Um, I'm more interested in possibility of what's available right now. And, um, you know, James Baldwin, the great Black American writer, said that uh, not, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And... Um, I think there's immense possibility in the present moment by facing our reality, an inner and external reality. It's not a hope. It's a possibility that's, it's not a hope for something to happen in the future. It's a possibility that dwells in the present. And I just, I don't believe in that possibility. I know that possibility. You know, much of my life, um, even after I've done a lot of really good healing work with others i had kind of a resigned demoralized sense about the possibility of my own healing and uh, the lifting of the cloud of hmm, hopelessness that i lived under it's gone it shows up some days but it shows up it doesn't take over for any length of time that means i've come a long way and that possibility was always there look um i have videos on my cell on my computer that i received recently from prisoners in death row in texas the best thing these people can hope for at least for crimes they committed as teenagers now they're 40 or more just one appeal after another. And the best thing they can hope for is that their death sentence will be converted to life in prison without parole. And they love life and they want to live. And they write poetry, they create art. Two of them are having an art exhibition of their work in Los Angeles in a couple of weeks where I hope to be to see it. Um, and these are people who see their they live in these open cages you see for 25 years and every once in a while they'll see one of their friends strapped to a gurney and wheeled off to their deaths and they live in the present they've had a spiritual awakening They've meditated. They've dealt with their trauma. They've faced their own remorse for what they did when they were unconscious. Now, I've seen so many people heal. These people are incredible. But that's the possibility for you. There's no reason to hope. It's a possibility. I've seen it and I've seen people live with possibility in the face of terminal illness that turned out not to be terminal after all. After, and I write about that in my new book, 
Not that I can promise secure to everybody. I'm just saying what's possible. So human possibility is almost infinite. So I don't have to believe in hope. I know the possibilities. So beautiful. You're you're bringing up a an experience I had in San Quentin. I had the honor of teaching there, and I thought I was going in with something that I had, and I was man these people were uh these men were so luminous they were luminous they were hungry to learn they had come they were like devouring every word they were uh i asked them to sort of think into reflect into uh their legacies from their mothers from their fathers they were filled with stories of 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 luminous life they were forgiving for their fathers they were uh, I was really, there was something about that. Nobody understands that uh, from the outside when you go into the inside and talk to these people, they're really um, filled with light. I was shocked and I learned I was healed by being in their presence. I was in San Quentin had the same experience that these yeah. lifers, these murderers, guess what? When they heal, they yeah. become... They become the most beautiful people in the world. Yeah. It's hard yeah. to explain that to anybody. Yeah. Totally my experience as well. Um, um, so, yeah, go ahead, Amichai. No, I just want to, I mean, thank you both for talking about the the, the reality of, of incarcerated folks and through your conversation, Gabra, what you're talking about not so much hope, but being here, really like being being present to, to what we'd rather not look at. And exactly. the healing can only come from that. Um, so as, as you're talking, I'm looking at some of the questions that are coming in, and I want to address like two of them. Um, Tirza, you're writing briefly in your book about PTG, post-traumatic growth. And what is it that we we, as you're both mentioning, how do we discover positivity and recognize from the place of pain in our individual human story regardless of our history the various abuses and the various difficulties that we bring with us as humans and so that's so sort of one question about how do we like if you say more about the the post-traumatic growth and then i'll say um there's an, several questions have come in and obviously many of us have our and as you both mentioned, our eyes on what's happening right now in Israel, what is happening in Palestine is just one of the many ways in which inherited intergenerational trauma is played out. And, uh, and a question that is coming out is, how is intergenerational trauma a framework for understanding and for moving towards resolving what's going on between Israel and Palestine right now and within Israel right now in many ways? So a question about the, the notion of, of um, post-traumatic growth and specifically. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll just uh, reiterate what Gabor has already said. When we turn to faith, and this is one of the first things that uh, the first, it is the first principle in the book, uh, Wounds into Wisdom, when we turn to really do the work of facing our pain feeling our pain, feeling our feelings. Uh, you know, this heart is this alchemical vessel. You know, we have this gift of a heart, but it takes courage to, 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 to face the profound grief, to, to yell, to shriek, to cry, to, to really face the pain and harness that pain. Uh, because when we turn our when we go into that place uh, and turn our pain into consciousness, it, it's fuel, it's fuel. We can do anything, but we can't turn away. We cannot deflect and project because when we, when we turn away, it's so easy to project it onto someone else and go get into a blame, uh, to blaming and dehumanizing the other and uh, taking it out on someone else to feel the pain. And that I would say is, is the first a piece of work if we do our personal work and and what are we talking about here we're um the brilliance of gabor's work the brilliance of uh all the research that's coming out now that he he tells all these amazing stories in his in his book uh uh the myth of normal uh and all the studies uh about 
if we, if we turn to face the pain and do our work of self-regulating, do the work of moving through, uh, not acting from the emotional brain, but um, getting well, becoming aware of our system, uh, regulating ourselves, being around people who can be healthy and help us co-regulate and get curious and investigate and peel back the layers uh, of our personal traumas, peel back the layers into our family trauma, into where does that live? Where did that live in my family? Where does it live in my culture? What are the myths of the culture that I am buying into? And get really do the work of sobriety. Um, then things start to really change. That's where PTG, post-traumatic growth begins. That's where healing begins, not only for the individual, but also for our for our families and also for our for the culture. And that is what is not unfortunately going on in Israel, Palestine right now, because there everyone is activated, everyone is dysregulated and in their fiery limbic lava is pouring and there's all kinds of pointing fingers and shooting first. Um, so uh, that's the work to me is starting with oneself and then and then regulating oneself, getting calm, getting curious, and then then starting to open the aperture into what's around me. But Gabor, I'd love to hear from you. What do you think? Well, very briefly on the question of post-traumatic growth, um, there's a chapter in my book called Disease as Teacher. Now, I don't recommend illness as a way of learning or schooling anybody, but I can tell you remarkably how many people that I've looked after in palliative care even at the end of life would say to me, this disease is the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that seems like a strange statement, but because by dealing with the illness, by facing um, reality, they actually became more truly themselves than they had been in their whole lives. And so that this tremendous growth possible from trauma, I won't, I don't need to add more to um, tears those eloquent words on that. As to Israel, Palestine, um, I want to tread very carefully here. I know how sensitive an issue this is. And for many of our fellow Jews, particularly of certain generations, this topic is almost forbidden. Mm. Can't even talk about it. And uh, I've had very close friends of mine with whom conversations have become almost impossible because the emotions that this issue generates. And I totally understand that from a certain point of view, the creation of Israel was the redemption of Jewish history. And that's a view that I used to immerse myself in and work for. I just haven't for a long time because I found out otherwise. And um, it's certainly true that in the face of anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe, particularly, and then just the unspeakable horror of the genocide, it's a very natural thought. We need a land of our own where we can be masters of our own fate, where we can have our own army, where we can't be wounded victims anymore. And it's also true that many of the Jews from Europe who fought in 1948 in Israel, Palestine, um, now they had guns in their hands. They were no longer victims. They weren't going to be marched to their deaths. They could actually resist and defeat the enemy. And if you talk to them, as many people did, they saw the Arabs as inheritors of the Nazi Jew hatred. So in fighting the Arabs, they were fighting the Nazis in their own minds. The latest persecutors. But what was the Palestinian experience? Mm -hmm. Their experience was that a people from Europe came to the land where they had lived for multiple hundreds of years and they declared that land to be theirs and that the inhabitants of that land were strangers all of a sudden in their own homes. And it's a undeniable fact of history, people, whether you want to face it or not, check the Israeli historians who've done their research. There was a very deliberate, conscious, planned, and murderous enterprise to exile the Palestinians from their homes 
and their lands. When you go to Eastern Europe, there are buildings that used to be synagogues and now they are cultural centers, if they exist. When you go to Israel, you see forests and fields under which lie the rubble of Palestinian villages that were deliberately destroyed. Don't take my word for it. Read the Israeli historians who have uncovered this research. So from the Palestinian point of view, just like from the point of view of any, and this is, by the way, I'm not singling the Jews out for specific criticism here. The same thing is true in Canada where I live or, or United States where Tirza lives that the indigenous people were told your rights don't exist anymore. We're going to take over because we have the right to your land. That colonial project is still going on in Canada, still going on in the United States, and it's still going on in Palestine. So it's not just a question of trauma, although that played into the psychology of people very much. And every people anywhere in the world whether they're Hungarians or Poles or Serbians or Croatians or Americans or British, they can very easily be put in touch with their sense of victimhood, for which there always will be evidence. <laughs> but what is so damn difficult for all of us as human beings is to see the point of view of the other. And that's what's going on right now. So, yes. Trauma had a whole lot to do with it. But it's also a project that has its colonial overtones and is behaving like a typical colonial power. That's the reality. Now, you can face that or not face it. It's painful for me. It was painful for me when I went there last summer to work with Palestinian women who'd been tortured in Israeli jails. And if you don't believe that happens, listen to rabbis for just peace or rabbis for human, human rights. rights or listen to the Israeli doctors for human rights. All this stuff is documented. Read the work, read the writings of the very brave Gideon Levy and Haaretz every day about just what happens. And, you know, people, I'm going to finish talking here. Someday in Israel and elsewhere, at, the, at Yad Vashem, if you, if you visit Yad Vashem, which is a wrenching experience. There's a memorial or an acknowledgement of the righteous amongst the nations, the righteous Gentiles. Someday I hope there'll be a memorial to the righteous Jews and Gideon Levy's name will be emblazoned in gold. <laughs> And Amira Haas, and, and there Amira are, Haas, there and, are and others. I, and, I, and I hope that Tirz and I will be small footnotes, at least. <laughs> because that's where I want to make my stand, so that what I've learned from my own trauma is not that never again, in the sense that it'll never happen to me, but never again will it happen to anyone. I mean. I mean. <laughs> I want to invite uh, both of you, Gabor and Tirza, and everybody watching to uh, to take a deep breath. If we know anything about what we carry in our bodies for all these generations and right now is that we carry in our bodies. And that um, the somatic healing that we all need begins with ourselves, as you've said, and needs to expand, expand beyond. You both shared some real painful truths and I know many of us are responding to with, with sorrow. And we're looking into the reality right now with a great deal of pain. And so I wanna end, we just have a few minutes left before we uh, invite you both to really just say a word of, of conclusion and then invite all of us here on the Zoom to learn more and, and read your books with a, another short quote Tirza, from your book that says, I have learned that we can recognize, choose, and redefine our own destinies. Even in the aftermath of ruinous events, humans are created with a capacity to heal from wreckage. 
transform fear into compassion and turn tragedy into strength. So thank you, both of you, for teaching us how to try and do that individually and collectively. I sense that the faith in the future of humanity and the Jewish people depends on these skills, nothing less. Hmm. So perhaps you both want to take a moment to just wrap. We have two minutes. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll let Tietze have the last word, given that it's her book that we're celebrating here, and uh, deservedly so. Um, I just want to say that I fully understand that some of what Tietze and I have shared today about our own perspectives may be difficult and painful to hear for some of you. You might even understand you might need to understand why we're talking that way. Um, I get that. Um, and I don't either resent it nor judge it. If you would were to reject our perspective, you have the right to your own. Um, it's a painful subject. And um, it has everything to do with our own trauma. And uh, interestingly enough, when I know of Palestinians and Jews that have done psychedelic ceremonies together, and what they all come out with is, I walked in here as an enemy, I walk them out of here as a friend. Mm -hmm. So that's possible. Amen. Amen. Uh, that's for our next discussion. <laughs> Hopefully there will be one. Uh, going to these going to these places that we can transcend ourselves, that we can uh, just go beyond ourselves, go beyond our Judaism, go beyond our identities, go beyond our uh, all the prisons, go beyond the prisons uh, that that keep us enclosed. Um, thank you so so much for everybody who's joined. Gabor, thank you, my brother, and. Uh, Rabbi Amichai, thank you so much. I, I would just say, as you go about your day now, please remember to love yourself. Uh, maybe love yourself as the as the most loving and wise and warm ancestor you have would love you. Embrace yourself. Uh, you don't need to complete the work, but we all need to engage it and embrace it. And uh, as Rabbi Tarfon said, uh, we'll end with a Talmudic quote. Uh, ours is not to complete the work, but neither are we able to look away. So uh, we're all here together in a global community. Let's go forward. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Links to the books are in the chat. This conversation will continue. Clearly, psychedelics and healing is our next agenda item. May it be so, and go in peace. Thank you to our hosts at Ayn and to the both of you for this really important, honest conversation. Thank you. Shalom.